Good morning and welcome. The global pandemic is an unprecedented crisis that is leaving the world with many unknown unknown. However, one of the knowns, and sadly it's one of our lived realities, is the increase in gender-based violence during the pandemic. Now, women have for centuries taken up the baton to ensure gender parity and to lobby for safety and security within society. And yet, despite a number of government agencies and the Honorable President Cyril Ramaphosa calling for an end to gender-based violence. The scourge continues and South African women are still living in fear. Whether we find ourselves in academia, government or parastatals, established or small businesses or civil society, inequality, marginalization or corruption has no boundaries. As we approach Women's Month during August, I thank you for joining the strategic conversation this morning that is aptly titled Ethical Responsibilities and Gender Bias in the Workplace. Today's session is a collaboration between the Nelson Mandela University Business School and its strategic partner, Business Ethics Network of Africa, which is fondly known as Ben Africa. Before we continue with the proceedings, let us today respectfully take a moment to observe the many deaths as a result of the global pandemic. Thank you. As we enter into the discussion, I highlight a few protocols that we should observe during the session. If you have any questions during the presentations by our panelists, please type them into the chat box in your Zoom control panel. We also acknowledge our attendees who are joining us from the YouTube platform. Our media technician will be adding your questions to the chat box for inclusion in the discussions today. We also take this opportunity to acknowledge the attendance of our faculty, the Faculty of Business and Economic Sciences, our colleagues of the Business School, we especially note the director of the Business School present today, Dr. Randall Jonas. We also acknowledge students of the Business School, especially the Business in Society MBA students who are currently um, undertaking an elective with our Business School. Our alumni, the Greater Nelson Mandela University, the Business Community, our fellow fellow higher education institutions globally, um, the past, we also want to acknowledge uh, the past president of Ben Africa, Professor Arnold Smith, the Ethics Institute and Globe Ethics. And of course, as well, not last and certainly not least at all, our esteemed panelists. And we apologize for those we may have missed um, acknowledging at this time. 
Without further delay, it is my privilege to introduce our partner and our moderator for the session today, Ms. Liesel Grunewald. Liesel is Senior Manager Organizational Ethics at the Ethics Institute in South Africa and the President of Ben Africa. Liesel holds a BA Communication Science degree, a Master's degree in Applied Ethics for Professionals, and Liesel is currently a PhD candidate in Applied Ethics with the University of Stellenbosch. Liesel has been in the field of organizational ethics since 2004, and her 30 years working experience includes being a national security manager, VIP protector, political analyst, corruption investigator. Liesel is also a seasoned facilitator for the Ethics Institute and the Institute of Directors. Liesel is also a frequent guest lecturer to various educational institutions globally. Her main expertise lies in advising organizations on ethics management and strategies. She also conducts um, ethics investigations, auditing hotline service providers. Liesel also advises whistleblowers and trains boards and social and ethics committees. Liesel is currently writing the Whistleblowing Handbook and she is responsible for researching the ethical status of corporate South Africa on a three-year basis. Without further ado, Liesel, you are most welcome. Thank you. Good morning. I'm so sorry for that pause. Thank you so much, Leanne, for um, uh, welcoming us all um, to this uh, panel discussion. And good morning from my side as well. Um, I will be leading our esteemed panelists this morning. You will see we have um, our panel discussion. And after that, uh, we will have a short closure by Dr. Brian Robinson. Uh, from the Nelson Mandela University Business School, as well as the, my colleague at Ben Africa uh, in the position of um, uh, treasurer. So I want to start with introducing um, the, the panelists. I'm going to do that. Um, I'm doing the introductions in a, in a row, can I say that? And then thereafter, I will hand over to them to speak. So our first panelist that I want to introduce is um, Roshni Gajar, and uh, she is the Managing Director of uh, Stratistude Consulting. Roshni is also a Chartered Accountant and a Certified Director and a Certified Risk Management Professional who has held various specialist positions in both the public and private sectors, including global pharmaceutical, uh, managed healthcare, assurance, and higher education organizations. Rajni, throughout her career, has converted strategic objectives and plans into results, unlocking growth opportunities, building lasting systems, and developing people and processes in the process. Her expertise includes strategy, finance, risk management, business development, corporate communications, and investor stakeholders relations. Rajni, as I've said, is the founder and managing director of Strat Astute Consulting. Roshni will be talking to us today about being a female in male-dominated industries. She will be followed by Nomkita, Nomkita Mono, um, who is the Chief Executive Officer um, of the Nelson Mandela Bay Business Chamber. Previously, she was also a CEO of a number of uh, organizations, as well as the registrar of the CCMA in Mpumalanga, and she was a commissioner of the Eastern Cape Planning Commission. She holds an MBA from Rhodes University. She also holds a master's degree in labor relations and human resources from the UPE, and she attained an honors degree in industrial relations uh, also from at the University of Port Elizabeth, as it was known then. Um, I apologize, I need to move the screen. There you go. Uh, Namkita was also the first black woman to be appointed to the board of Goodyear Tire and Rubber Holding South, South Africa. She currently serves on and chairs 
the boards of a number of organizations. There were too many, I couldn't get them all onto the slide. Nonkita will be talking to us about the challenges and opportunities for women in top positions uh, in the face of gender bias in business. The following panelist will be Professor Shirley Zinn. And Shirley is the former group head of human resources at a number of uh, organizations, including uh, Woolworths Holding Limited, um, Standard Bank uh, Group, um, and uh, she was also HR executive at NetBank. She was also an HR executive at the South African Revenue Service. She has her own registered company, which is Shirley Zinn Consulting, and that provides consulting and advisory services in the HR, transformation, leadership, and uh, field of education. Shirley is an extraordinary professor at the University of Pretoria and also an adjunct professor at the University of Cape Town. She is also registered as a master HR professional with the South African Board for People Practice. And she serves on a number of uh, boards of many organizations. Um, I counted and I got to 16. I might have missed one or two. In 2015, Shirley published her bestseller, Swimming Upstream. And this focuses on her personal and professional journey. It has um, been officially announced as a bestseller. And since the launch of her book, she has done several swimming upstream talks nationally at corporate schools, universities, and charities with the hope and the aim of motivating and inspiring, especially disadvantaged youth and women. Now, Shirley has won a number of awards. I just mentioned a couple of them there, top women in business and government and top executive in corporate South Africa, excellence in global HR leadership. Uh, she was awarded uh, the top 30 Wonder Women in South Africa award, Africa's most influence, influential women in business and government for 2016 uh, in the SME sector and continental winner in the business and professional services sector by GE CEO Global. And then last but not least is our final panelist. And um, this is Dr. Valile Vellani. Valile is a postdoctoral researcher in the Center for High Resolution Transmission, Electron Microscopy at Nelson Mandela University. He has published peer-reviewed articles in international journal platforms presented at local and international conferences and received peer recognition in the form of awards for best paper in the field written by an early career researcher. Valida's problem solving skills, which he matured um, during his engineering studies, find expression in the fight for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex rights, locally as well as internationally. He has reviewed the re uh, presentation of gender and sexual minorities in South Africa's life orientation curricula and proposed best practice procedures for curricula reform, which informed the development of the new um, learning um, uh, and orientation curricula 2019, which was implemented nationally. He has also published a book chapter which documents the experiences of transgender people in education, health, and the legal sectors of Eswatini's government, and informed an international platform about the existence and the daily struggles of these marginalized populations. Valile sits on the board of Social Health Empowerment, which empowers transgender women in the rural parts of the Eastern Cape. He is one of the founding members of Transswati, uh, which currently caters for the health needs, uh, but also intends to cater for the legal and educational needs for transgender people in Eswatini. Bilani piloted an initiative for legal recognition of transgender persons in Eswatini, and he is actively engaging Eswatini's executive government to enact policies that allow transgender people to change their gender marker in their national identification documents. Now with that mouthful, um, 
I will hand over to the panelists. I would just uh, forgot to say that Valili will be talking to us about gender bias experiences from a transgender activist uh, perspective. And Shirley will be talking to us about also from her experience, sound ethical values, moral courage, and strong personal vision, the foundation for building resilience and overcoming adversary. You are most welcome panelists. We are looking forward to um, your expertise and your experiences that you're going to share with us. And with that, I hand over to Roshni um, to kick off our discussion. Morning, Liesl. Thank you very much for the introduction and morning to everyone who's listening. A special welcome to our gents who've joined us today as we uh, embark on Women's Month starting tomorrow. So gender bias is the tendency or a culture to prefer one gender over the other. In my career, it's been very subtle. It does engage, impact us in the workplace. So experiences went as follows, and I can kind of put them into about five categories, which I'll speak about um, during our conversation today. Sorry, I'm just trying to... Okay, so the five goes as follows. The first is not feeling like you belong in the workplace. You continue to find ways to be acknowledged and to fit in. The second being not being given an actual decision-making authority and the authority to execute while you do all this hard work in the background just to support your male counterparts and bosses who ultimately look like the better performers. When this does not work out as planned, the female gets victimized. Then the resources to actually execute decisions, being given equal footing to do the, the tools to do the job. Fourth, being treated fairly with due respect to the language with which a woman communicates with it at work. Women are nurturing, they have vulnerable personalities, and instead of rewarding it, it often gets exploited. And fifthly, being recognized and celebrated as a unique individual and being given the environment, the policies, the systems, and most importantly, the support to thrive. So Liesl, when, you, when I read this topic of ethical responsibilities and gender bias, seeing those words together almost seem like an oxymoron. So there can surely be nothing morally acceptable about any type of prejudice in the workplace, including gender bias. I went, to, went and had a look at the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Right number 21 speaks about responsibility. It says we have a duty to other people and we should protect their rights and freedoms. When we look at the workplace, uh, we have a great corporate governance code in South Africa called King 4. And King 4, the principles, talks about ethical and effective leadership, responsible corporate citizenship, and its overall aim is to provide a sound moral culture within the workplace and adopt an inclusive approach. So boards and business leaders most certainly have a responsibility to provide equal opportunities to employers in a space that is free of bias. We must understand that the third industrial revolution has embedded a patriarchal and hierarchical system in businesses. When the industrial revolution came about, the level of automation freed up time amongst the aristocracy and the industrialists. So whilst the workers were in the factory and the fields, the business men found ways to connect outside of business at the social clubs and through sport. That's when um, professional sports started. And when the business men went out to play, what happened to the women? She possibly became the woman behind the successful men and did what was necessary to support the man's position in society and in business. So this is the culture that is embedded in our society today. Men are perceived to be the breadwinners and they are perceived to be the strategic decision makers. Last year, I attended a function where the 30% Club of Southern Africa in consultation with the IODSA and Tuesday Consulting, they published a report on the state of gender on the JSE listed boards that publication was delivered last year, but the report reflects data from 2018. The statistics are as follows. 310 listed companies were surveyed. 
259 companies did not publish any gender policies. 291 companies have not achieved gender parity. 229 companies have no gender diversity targets or haven't met those targets. 67 companies adopt the one and done approach. And that means as soon as you have one female on a board position, that's enough, they've achieved their target. And 30 companies in South Africa do not have any female board members. So for me, what COVID-19 is doing, it's actually highlighting the systemic inadequacies and in inequalities, including issues around gender biases. Let's take a look at how COVID-19 is impacting females in society. Women make up 70% of all health and social services staff globally. Women also account for the majority of the world's older population. That means they're vulnerable. Interestingly, in Africa, or more concerningly, women account for 40% of the COVID cases, which range from about 35%, and in South Africa, it's as high as 55%. As we have heard, domestic, sexual, and gender-based violence is increasing. This did happen during Ebola and the Zika epidemics, so we knew that the risk was there. The World Bank report says that informal workers account for about 90% of the labor force. Most of these are women, and these jobs are at risk at the moment. In South Africa, in a survey of households, it was shown that 42% of children live with single female parents. That essentially means that that female parent is the breadwinner. Between February and April, three million jobs were lost in South Africa. Two of the three million jobs represent women. If they didn't lose their job, then 58% of women in South Africa face reduced working hours, which means they earn less versus 42% of men. This issue is very prevalent on the African continent and Benita Diop, who leads the um, African Union Commission Special Envoy on Women, Peace and Security, she made quite a courageous and forward-looking statement um, a few weeks ago. She says, I call for a fundamental shift in our agenda for peace and transformation. Our actions must be anchored on three critical pillars. Number one, women's leadership. Number two, investments in social infrastructures for human security, and number three, solid accountability. So as a qualified chartered accountant, I take solid accountability quite seriously in my career. Um, and really just my background, I've been with a corporate company for about, companies for about 20 years in the spaces of finance, healthcare, and pharmaceuticals. I also work more recently in the public sector in the space of higher education. In the consulting field, I've worked across the healthcare, manufacturing, industrials, automotive, health tech, fintech, and construction sectors. Um, and Liesl, you spoke, asked me to speak about my experience in the automotive sector. That's more in my personal space of media and international motorsport, and I'll share some stories there with you. I must admit that I'm not a mother, but I took responsibility for my family at quite a young age. So as a qualified accountant, when I started my articles, um, I did find a great sense of belonging in the profession and in my peers around me. However, in my office where I served my articles, there were about 10 partners and only one female partner. There were a number of senior managers and managers that were female, but they didn't all make it to the partnership level. And I always wondered why. Later in my career, I saw similar patterns across the executives that I worked with in the corporate space. There were a whole range of females at the junior and mid-management tier, but not so many at the executive tier, and even fewer at the board level. I did notice that my female peers, once they got married and started having families, they started to feel the conflict between the responsibility at work and the demands thereof, and the personal responsibilities of being a responsible parent um, and a mother at home. And this often compromised their personal ambitions. The other thing I noticed from a sense of belonging is that time in the pub for guys certainly counts. And often we had to leave the pub early um, because we had responsibilities at home. And also one doesn't want to be labeled hanging around the pub too often on a Friday evening. But the grapevine does start there and the social networks too start there. 
Um, and just, just to note that, you know, that one female partner that I had and those very few female executives, when they did find themselves in like a social workspace, they were quite awkward because they were so used to working and they found that as soon as they had time to let their hair down, they might show that little streak of vulnerability. So we never really did see that side of our, our female colleagues there. Subconsciously, when you're starting off your career and when you're progressing through your career path, these things do shape you. Shape you um, and I did see a ceiling that existed. Of course, social perceptions of what girls or women should do and what they should not do starts at home and it does influence your adulthood and also your career. So growing up, I tasted the freedom of being able to express my individuality but also having a very strong disciplined approach to responsibility. And those responsibilities are very different for males and females. Responsibility to a male often means power to make decisions. It's an action driven mandate that they are given. In the case of females, I find that that translates to servant leadership. It's care given, it's very responsibility focused. So often you're given the titles as a female executive, but not necessarily the tools, the budgets, the resources to make the decisions and to carry them out effectively. I've been fortunate to work with male leaders and executives who are in themselves very balanced individuals. So I had their 100% um, support to thrive through my career. And I'm very grateful to those. Um, I was given the full freedom to express myself through my work. The trust was strong. There was a good cultural fit and the emotional maturity um, in that environment was quite high. In those same spaces though, I did also experience needing to justify my salary, motivate for fair scores on the KPAs and to submit long proposals for promotional opportunities. Sometimes even my um, male peers and counterparts realized what I was doing and thought it was absolutely bizarre but at the high levels, nothing much was done about it at that stage. That's the way it was. Then there have been instances, Lisa, when we talk about ethics, where when I chose to do the right thing and stand firm in what I believed was right, I did face victimization. And in some cases, it even bordered onto sexual harassment, if I have to think about it honestly. In one situation, I recall, um, I was called out as being an outlier in another situation, when I stood my ground and was quite decisive on a matter of ethics, the colleague openly questioned my gender. Did I report this at the time? No, I didn't. But in hindsight, maybe I should have. Should have. And why didn't I? I think it's perhaps because I didn't feel that I had a safe space as an executive in the system to almost go and blow the, the whistle. And um, I was more concerned, I guess, about the perceptions that this might raise. So in those instances, my sense of belonging was low and most certainly one can't thrive in a situation like this. What I found missing most during those times, Liesl, was the fact that I didn't find that I could confide in any one female at the senior executive or at the board level who would support me through this process. That may have been my own perception, but I just did not find that safe, comfortable space. So, you know, I'd be really, really keen to see this mold broken and a lot more solidarity around women. I find that amongst guys, there's an unwritten code that solidifies a collection, the collegiality amongst them. With women in high positions, it seems to be less visible and less recognizable. Um, and as things develop in our workspaces, maybe we should start taking a closer look at this. Safe spaces means being able to listen to different voices in the room. Women most certainly bring different perspectives to any situation. Women, in my view, are outcomes focused. They'll get the job done, but they also take the time to look at the bigger picture. Gender bias, harassment and victimization are real. I do believe that they're going to become more amplified as, as the job security issues and financial security issues um, grow over the next 18 months and women will need extra support in the workplace. 
So I'd like to see social and ethics committees becoming a lot more intentional about identifying and monitoring how the corporate culture is either serving or prejudicing people working within it. The second one is around fair rewarding systems. So globally, women earn just 79 cents out of every dollar men make. And that's before taking into account any additional work that they naturally do, which doesn't get uh, factored in into your total cost to company. By nature, a woman is a creator, she's a nurturer. Her work ethic is to create shared value. And like I said, she will get the job done. Unfortunately, she'll do this despite how you treat her. With males, males are more transactional, they, their boundaries are clearer, and they're great at compartmentalizing their responsibilities. Women are highly responsible and diligent, and I've seen this across all industries. So when the corporate language talks about sweating the assets, which is a term that makes me cringe, what impact does that have on females who always, always go the extra mile? The female is unlikely to fight back and she internalizes her responses. So is this vulnerability um, exploited in the workplace? Often going the extra mile for a continued basis, we know that is not sustainable without being fairly rewarded. And this often leads to burnout and de debilitating illnesses. When we also consider um, you know, who's going to get the job done in the workplace, they say that give it to someone who's super busy or give it to a single mother. So we need to be careful around how these perceptions translate into how we treat women in the workplace. The perception of single mothers, the perception, perception of female entrepreneurs. Um, so biases in policy systems and the work culture most certainly need some critical thinking. In the consulting spaces, you know, it's been really eye-opening to see how men and women are treated differently. Um, female entrepreneurs are, they, they do try hard to get their pound of flesh out of um, consultants or female entrepreneurs because they do believe that we're not going to fight back. That's not always the case. Um, but because we try to see the bigger picture, we don't always become immediately defensive. Um, and that's not going to help sustain female-led businesses or entrepreneurships. We must also remember that the price of bread, inflation, interest rates, and taxes have absolutely no gender bias. So maybe the financial system needs to look into this and to understand that if women only earn, earn 79 cents in every dollar, then should we be, be paying the same type of pricing on our macro factors. So back to the, the automotive industry then, um, that is one of my passions. And I'd like to say that when passion meets purpose, it seems like things work a lot better. So in the motorsport industry, um, I'm involved there in some media spaces on the international um, motorsport side. And what I find really interesting was because there's an idea or something of interest that connects you, the doors are quite open, um, they're open conversations, females are invited into spaces, and a lot of work has been done in that environment around creating administrative and executive roles for females and giving specific focus to opening um, that world up and the opportunities up for females. Um, it was an interesting conversation that Claire Williams, the team principal of uh, Williams was having. She said that she's absolutely loved this lockdown situation. She loves these Zoom calls as opposed to the face-to-face -face meeting contact sessions because when she feels cold, she can turn on and off the air conditioner as she likes. She can sit there with a blanket if necessary. Um, but more importantly, by the fact that digitization enables putting your hand up, there are some certain protocols that equalize males and females. She says she's actually started getting a voice that she doesn't usually have in an open environment. Sneha Sharma, who is a, um, a female racer in India, a patriarchal society, she's worked her way up and paid her own way to finally get to the Formula 4 stage. She's also a professional pilot. And while she was doing this, she did get um, various, you know, jargon thrown at her by the men saying she should get out and she should find a 
a better, a more appropriate career for herself. But she's proved them wrong and she's right up there now. Renee Naylor, who's the physiotherapist for the box, um, Renee Naylor, when she heard that she fell pregnant, she was quite concerned about how this is going to impact her career. But because they were all in it together, as soon as the executives in rugby heard that, they you know, offered that at the next tour, they'd make it possible for her to take her ch the newborn baby along and have the right support so that she can carry on with her job. So these things are quite important, Liesl, because it's important to encourage girls to have fun and to express themselves because herein possibly lies a balance. So looking at the way forward, things are changing fast. Digitization does have an equalizing opportunity. Interestingly, McKinsey research shows that women hold the leadership traits for the new normal. That includes inspiration, participative, participative decision making, and aligning expectations and rewards. Interestingly, just as recently as this week, the JSC released its gender neutral four month leave policy. They've done this as part of a policy overhaul to eliminate gender stereotyping. Um, in line with the sustainable development goals. So no doubt that the listed companies are going to be compelled to follow soon. The need for more intentional peer groups, mentorship programs and females, both in organizations and the gig economy is important. Like I said, I'd like to see um, social and ethics committees play a bigger part in this and let's bring our male counterparts into these immersion groups. Let's review the language of businesses and the policies and just to close off, you know, please look after the females in your business because she is undoubtedly the mother of the new normal. Thanks, Liesl. Rajni, thank you so much um, for your very interesting and, and thought-provoking um, input. Um, I haven't thought of the fact that uh, a gender bias in, in terms of these, the technology that we're using these days that, that has an impact and a positive impact um, uh, at that. So, so thanks, and, and thank you for the other insights. We've had a question or two, uh, which I will pose a bit later um, to you. Thank you, Roshni. Our next panelist then is uh, Nomkita Mona. Nomkita, um, we look forward to your input. Thank you, Liesl, and good morning, everybody. A father and son, uh, were involved in an accident, it's a car accident. So the father walked off unhurt and the son needed to go to hospital for some surgery. And as he was wheeled into the operating room, the surgeon on duty uh, takes one look at him and says, oh no, I couldn't possibly um, operate on this patient. He's my son. So I wanted to pause a little bit there and just think about how many of you didn't think that the surgeon was the mother, where you were you know, confused about the fact that he was with the father, but then he's now supposed to be operating on him. Because it is said that men tend to uh, go for the higher paying jobs, uh, which are doctor, engineer, CEO, while women tend to go for the lower paying careers as a female engineer, a female doctor, and a female CEO. So I hope you get the, um, the irony of this whole thing about how we are viewed even though we're doing the same jobs. I want to start off with a disclaimer around um, what I want to talk about today. Firstly, it's that I myself do not see myself as a woman first. That's not how I wake up every morning and think, ooh, I'm a woman. I see myself as a human being who has every right to be in every space that I choose to be in. And I feel like, um, and then, okay, then I, I do acknowledge that I am a woman purely because of the apparatus I was born with, and therefore I will operate in the, in the space. But at the same time, I also acknowledge that the other gender also has an equal, but not more bigger a right uh, than me to be in this space. But also I want to make the following disclaimer that I am an eternal optimist and that um, no males will be bashed throughout my talk today. Uh, but at the same time, this eternal optimism has served me in a very big way throughout my whole life. 
So when I was thinking about how it is that I would frame my talk this morning, I thought about framing it on three different areas. Firstly, it was around how it is that, uh, what is your definition of success? But of course, this is not just for me, this is for anybody who's listening because what happens to you or what you do with the information you share today will definitely be framed around what your definition of success is. Uh, but secondly, uh, about what a, a concept called the danger of a single story. I'll talk about that a little bit uh, in a few minutes. I must apologize if you hear some noises, or some banging noises, they're coming from above me. I was not aware that there's gonna be work happening in the building. Um, and then thirdly, uh, the, the last uh, framing that I thought I should do is around how we as South Africans um, have, like if you look at the post-apartheid uh, South Africa, where we black people took over power, uh, and, but then we then changed nothing. So then it makes me think about what it is that we want to do as women, as we apply this gender lens um, in terms of what we need to do. Do we just want to take over and just carry on as the men did over the last however many centuries that they've been in power? Uh, or do we want to continue running things as they've done? Or is it that we want to change things? Because I don't see them they, um, um, as, as having succeeded, if you like. So I don't see, it doesn't look like it was a success to me, how they have run things. And also, if you look at, I think Roshni mentioned the issue around the pandemic itself. Look at the pandemic. Look at the approaches that, they, that are being used worldwide. Uh, and also many other failures that are happening. If you think about the fact that in South Africa, three million people lost their jobs, uh, you know, in the first um, month of the lockdown as a result of the pandemic. Of that three million, two million are women. So you can understand how the whole thing or how the system is actually uh, rigged against women, if you like. So my thesis really is about the fact that we should strive for inclusivity and gender equality, and then we change the world. But then if I go back to the second frame that I used about this when I spoke about the danger of a single story, I was quoting a Nigerian author, Chimamanda Ngozi Adishie. She makes the point that if you show a people as one thing, is only that one thing over and over again. That is what they become. And that for me says we must tell our own stories as women because even our own stories are told by you know, the, the other gender. I was reading something, I think I found it on LinkedIn. They were talking about how the, the initial calendar was um, uh, is developed or designed. And they said they found a bone with 28 incisions. And they were saying that a man developed it those many years ago, but when they looked at it and they were asking themselves, which men would require to count every 28 day cycles in any calendar. So clearly that was developed by a woman as well, but our stories are not told by us. So it's important that um, how women are portrayed over time. It's also brought about, um, you know, the whole story about the male breadwinner bias. Uh, Roshni did mention this thing about male being seen as breadwinners, and this leads to a gender pay gap, which is actually not based on anything other than the fact that the feminine gender therefore gets to uh, get the, the short end of the stick. So it's important for us that women do need to speak for themselves and make sure that they negotiate pay because it is said that 7% of women, only 7% of women do negotiate their pay. Other women just take what they get given. I myself have done this before, where I walked into a position which was at a certain level, but because I was a woman, I was offered less than what my male predecessor was on. But I thought, oh, I'm good, I'm going to perform. They're going to see how good I am, and therefore they will increase my salary. That never happened. So I've never made that mistake again going forward. So it's important that you, you're able to negotiate as you step in, because these issues bring, bring forward issues like in the, an implicit bias, where you have what they call male preference, 
And, and interestingly, it's not only males who prefer males, it's both male and female that do tend to prefer males in the workplace. But also you come to a concept called in-group uh, favoritism, where we rather are comfortable with people who, are, who look like us and who are like us in many ways. But the biggest one for me was the one they call the maternal wall, where it's a stereotype that links motherhood with lack of uh, commitment and competence. So the, the view here is that when, when somebody uh, becomes a mother, then they kind of focus on the baby and they don't focus on anything. I mean, that has been proven to be not true. If you look at Jacinda Ardern, the prime minister of New Zealand, she is said to be the first prime minister in the whole world who has had to deal with a, a pandemic, um, I think also um, a terrorist attack, as well as an earthquake, all in one term of her presidency. And then they add, while she was holding a baby, and she did all that at the same time. So there's nothing wrong with being female, you bring what you can, etc. So this gender bias does have uh, negative effects on women, but I'm just going to talk about two of them. The imposter syndrome, but at the same time, a crisis of confidence. So this whole issue around the imposter syndrome is about, it's a pervasive feeling of fraudulence. You know, you are here, you are this strong female CEO or whatever, but you know, sometimes you, you second guess yourself, you think, you know, am I worth it? Am I ready? Do I really uh, belong here, etc. So, and, and also the feeling that one doesn't, you know, deserve these accolades and these accomplishments that people give. And therefore you always feel less capable and less than the other. And then there's the whole issue around self-doubt comes in. Then the, the second one is around a crisis of confidence. You are in this job, you're doing this thing, and then because there's some voices, you know, in and around you, then you start second guessing yourself as well as a woman. Um, and also you have this loss of, of confidence in your own abilities. And also you then start to believe other people's opinions about you know, who you are, et cetera. So women do need to, uh, they structurally, generally tend to undervalue their own uh, value that they bring to the table. And, and these issues can actually prevent women from voicing their own ideas or applying uh, for positions in which they could easily excel. I mean, there, there's always something that has happened to me over the, a, a long time. I've been a, a young manager from my early 30s. I was in boardrooms and I was CEO. And, and then I'm black and then I'm female. I think everything gets added onto that. But you would find that you have an idea which you advance and then, okay, it's quiet. And then a few minutes around the table, some male tends to uh, bring the same idea and it's like the greatest idea ever. And you think, wow, were these people in the same meeting as I was? Because this is exactly what I just said. But um, over time, I used to just really just let it slide. But I think, I don't know whether it's, it's, it's age or maturity, I don't let it slide anymore. I, it actually just annoys me so much. So I do think that it's, a part, it's about part of the responsibility that we have when we see um, you know, um, issues around um, unfairness, et cetera, do not keep quiet. But what I find, especially with women, is that because I'm in the room, they will talk about Roshni in her absence in a derogatory way, and then I'm supposed to be part of the boys. And, and I don't call them on that nonsense as they do it. And then, and then thinking that when I'm not in the room, that doesn't happen to me. So I think that's a problem that we need to be, it's an ethical responsibility for women to speak up when you see something, even when it doesn't happen to you. Um, but also, uh, two more minutes, if, if I may. I'm going towards my conclusion. So in conclusion, women, I, I, I have a wish that I would like to live in the world uh, where race and gender actually are not a criteria for anything that we need to do to participate in the economy or in the world. But also I wish to live in a world where women would become able to uh, actually have, have their own voice. And, and I was laughing at the end before we started, she was 
correcting something that was done on the program. And she says, oh, I'm sorry, um, can I correct this? And I said to her, you are doing exactly what we say we shouldn't do as women. We should not be apologetic when we've done nothing wrong. And I wanted to end off with a quote from Viktor Frankl, uh, where he says that when we are unable to change a situation, then we are challenged to change ourselves. And I really want the women in this country, in, on this continent and on this world, to start thinking differently about what it is that we, we need to do. And thank you very much for your time. Namkita, thank you so much. I was looking at the chat um, box and uh, uh, it was saying that uh, the, the examples that uh, both you and, and Roshni have been using just resonate so much uh, with people in the audience. So, um, yeah, and also with me, I must say. Um, without further ado, Shirley, it is uh, your turn to please uh, take us on your journey. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And uh, Liesl, thank you very much uh, to you and the panelists and the Nelson Mandela Business School for the opportunity this morning. Uh, my timer is running, so I promise you I will not go over the 10 minutes. Um, I just want you to bear with me a little bit as I share some of my personal and professional story with you. Um, and um, and it just to, to the, the book Swimming Upstream really was written um, to inspire hope despite yeah. adversity, especially for young women. Um, I think I'm living in of, of what is possible in a seemingly impossible situation. And I was just moved to write this book. It is one of the most difficult undertakings that I have ever done. And um, I have been so uplifted um, by the sharing of the stories. And I think the more we share our stories, the more we're able to inspire and uplift, um, especially young people in the current situation. You know, life tosses us curveballs, adversity, tragedy, rejection, um, and even pandemics. And really, how do we rise um, um, from this within ourselves? You know, what, you know, what is the strong internal driver that makes us lift ourselves up when we, when we go down? And so I wanted to just share a little bit um, about myself and where I came from. Um, I've already listened uh, and thanks for the gracious intro introduction, Liesl. I think you've covered a lot of it for me. But the bits that are not in the in the in the write up are just want to fill in the gaps. So I was born, and let's get this out of the way very quickly, in 1961, um, in Cape Town, in the Cape Flats of Cape Town, an area called Steenburg. Um, those of you who might be familiar with this area. Um, it is one of those spatial arrangements that is an apartheid uh, sort of conceptualization of how you can push people to peripheries um, of society. Um, it's a place that's still very much. Um, is, 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 you know, there's so much gender violence, there's so much, there's gangsterism, gangsterism, drugs, teenage pregnancies, every possible horror around a poverty, unemployment, um, um, and social economic inequality on imaginable, uh, unbelievable um, um, that, you, that you, you, you can't even begin to imagine. And so for, for girls to, to, to go through a situation, I have a sister that's three years younger than I am. And I was born to parents who worked in factories and warehouses and they did not finish their high school. But they did understand the importance of education somehow in all of this. And when we were a very young age, and that's why I'm such a strong believer in early childhood education, um, my father particularly sat down and said to us, you know, um, please make something of nothing please do not get stuck in this place. Um, and after many conversations, I would actually say to him, so dad, in the end, what is it that you want us to achieve? And he would say, please just get your matric. Get your matric and then you can go and work, okay? Um, and, and I committed to him that I would work very, very hard to achieve matric. Now, I don't have to tell you about the statistics around matric, uh, um, about uh, primary school education um, uh, through, um, through to high school and how many get on in grade one and drop off on grade, by grade 12. Um, and they really are um, lost to society. Nobody goes to check to see what has happened to these learners. Um, and, and, um, and so half of us don't make it. And, and, it's a, and communities like us, a, a tenth of us might make it. Um, but nonetheless, um, this was a promise I made. My mom on the flip side was um, a very values-driven person. So 
So seeds of, um, you know, you must respect people. You must uh, continue to be humble because arrogance doesn't get you anywhere in this world. Um, and there's a fine line between the two. And I was to learn that um, um, throughout my life. Um, perhaps with the, the third thing is that you've got to work hard um, every single day at everything you do, but it's pointless working hard if you're not doing it well. So you don't have to be perfect, but just be the very best that you can be in everything that you do. There's simple little lessons. Um, live in service of others. And, um, and maybe one last message I think that stayed with me is uh, show an act of kindness, you know, where you can every day. We live in a brutal, in a brutal world. And so we grew up with these messages and it, it resonated with me so much. I've held on to it my whole life. We went to primary school. It became tough to walk up that road where, uh, you know, it was then called um, Concert Boulevard. For those of you familiar with Cape Town, if you're going down the M5 to the Musenberg, to Musenberg you've got Lavendale on your left and you've got these old council houses on the right. And that's where we actually grew up. And so um, the walking up and down to school didn't work very well. We ended up with my grandmother and I'm sure many of us in the room here have grandmothers that have taken care of us sometime in our lives and extended families. And so we need to cherish uh, people like this who, who, who contribute to our lives in such, in such significant ways. We don't realize it in that particular moment. So as, as, as two young girls, my sister and I are very rebellious, very upset that we have to live with a grandmother. But nonetheless, um, she taught us about discipline. She taught us about punctuality. She taught us about diligence and getting things done um, and being organized. And I'm so grateful to her today. And, and I want to... I want to just um, affirm people like this in our society today who do these kinds of, you know, um, um, formative um, um, lessons in our lives that stay with us for the rest of our lives. And so, of course, I went on to high school. I went to a school called South Peninsula High. I was um, 14 years old or whatever in 1976 when the first national uprising in education happened. And I think it was there that I began to link the dots between my my socioeconomic status in my community that I came from, um, the apartheid regime of the day, um, the um, economics that I found myself in and the financial uh, challenges that our communities face and continue to face. And then of course the role of education in all of this. And there was a little activist in me that started to you know push to say, you cannot stand by and allow this to happen. Um, and the time for being silent um, is over on these things. And I think, I think that um, has gone with me into workplaces, into my role as an HR professional, where I have tried to infuse some of this into policies, into practices, into uh, what organizations' purpose and values are. And, and uh, you know, um, hopefully shifted the needle a little bit in some, of these, in some of these places, although it's hugely, hugely challenging to do so. Nonetheless, in my metric year, the middle, I was so excited about finding being metric and making this huge vision happen. Um, in the middle of that year, two teachers sat me down and they said to me, you know what, and I want you all to listen to this because this is, it was a seminal moment in my life. They said to me, you know what, you are not the brightest pea in the pod, okay? You're not, you're not you know, smashing the lights out academically, but you know what you have? You have the potential to do so much more. And every single person in this room today, whatever it is that you've achieved and you've done, you have enormous potential to do much, much more. You have talent, you have magic embedded in yourself. Often, not half of that is unleashed for a whole variety of reasons, be they societal, be they fear and anxiety, which is, which is a, a real thing. It's kind of, what if I fail? What will people think? Um, and, and there's little voices in yourself that tell you you can't do a thing when you actually can do it. And, and then you just need somebody for five minutes, like these two teachers, and I'm sure we all have a teacher's story, that will say to you, um, you know what, you can do this. And I said to these teachers, what is it that you want me to do? And they said, please go home tonight and talk to your parents about university. University was not in our worldview, was not in our language, was not understood. What we did understand was that it cost money and time to do this. And so, of course, I was very uplifted by the thought that these two teachers thought that I had potential and could do this. And when I got home that night, I had a fight with my parents around it, and they said to me, you can go to university, you're going to get a bursary, you have to work really hard and get through this. 
you're still going to do your weekend job. And all of these things, as, as, as terrible as it sounded at, at the time, I am truly grateful today for having had this opportunity. And of course, I was at UWC. Um, these teachers, I, you know, I just need to say to teachers today, the jobs are, are, you know, and even if you look in the current context, I think they are so underpaid, undervalued. Um, and, and we and our educators, our health workers, people on the front line need to applaud, be applauded for the difference that they're making in the lives of people. And I'm truly grateful for that five minutes that those teachers spent with me. And I want to encourage all of us in the room today. Five minutes can change the trajectory of somebody's life forever. And I think that if each one of us went and, and in the old days, in the 80s, we used to say each one teach one. If we can each one of us take one or two young people under our wing, inspire them, motivate them, uplift them, it will make a huge difference to the way our society uh, it currently operates, where things are about self-interest, greed, and um, you know um, what's in it for me. So, 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 so anyway, I um, I went on to the University of the Western Cape. I did a, a BA and a high diploma in education. That was the only thing I could do to get a bursary, I suppose, next to being a social worker and a nurse at the time. Um, and I just picked it. I didn't know what I wanted to do. But when I got there, it was the year 1980, and it was a huge uprising um, once again. And then my 10 minutes is over. But I do want to end, and I want to say to you that um, the impossible um, is possible. We are faced with constant stress, overload, demand, distraction, and somebody talked about burn, burnout earlier. We have the resilience to overcome huge adversity. Find the space to be actively hopeful, even when times are tough, um, and uh, surround yourself with people who will uplift and inspire you. We're often surrounded by toxic people. We often inherit them, but we can purposefully choose who we want to spend our time with. For me, um, we had a, uh, you know, I, I went to Harvard, I did a, a master's and a doctorate at Harvard. I never ever imagined anything in my life like that would happen. I was very, very fortunate to have that happen. And in the middle of that, we gave birth to our son, Jamie. This book is dedicated to Jamie. He was born in 1995. I graduated in 97. Um, and we came home with my doctorate and this beautiful baby. Um, and the saddest thing in my life happened in, in 2003. We had this our only child, we had a beautiful Christmas here in Cape Town. We were driving back to Johannesburg, not even 10 minutes in the car. Somebody knocked us on the N2 just at the Cape Town International Airport um, and um, on a beautiful Friday afternoon. And we lost Jamie on the side of the road that day. Then I was 24 hours touch and go. I didn't, no one thought I was going to live. Um, and when I heard about Jamie passing, I was, we, uh, Kevin and I, completely and utterly devastated. And so every day I have to get up and live my life with meaning and purpose. And even during that time, I didn't take the time to heal. I didn't take the time to reach out for help. We must find ways to reach out for help when we need the help. Um, and I want to encourage you today, especially with the challenges we face today around our mental wellness and the challenges that we face. So um, all I want to say is let's continue to live our values. Let's have a vision for the future. Let's build an inclusive, uh, an inclusive society, take the learnings from COVID and show our, humani our humanitarian leadership, which is really going to be required. Empathy and compassion can produce results. Humility can produce very good profits as well. And we need to make sure that we take care of, of not only our profits, our people, our environment, our children. And I think we must ensure that that is really what we're all about. So um, as Maya Angelou said, still arise. And I want to encourage all of you to hold on to that. And if you haven't read that poem, please go and read it. So thank you for listening so graciously. I wish you love, joy, safety, and good health during these unprecedented times. I thank you, Liesl. Oh, thank you, Shirley. Um, I've looked at the comments again, and please have a look there because uh, you've got so many messages that says that um, uh, you are just such an inspiration. And uh, I've never told this to you, but uh, uh, you were actually also an inspiration to me many years ago when we worked together at SARS. And uh, you were the nicest and most inspiring HR uh, executive that I ever came across and have come across again. So thank you also uh, for my for inspiring me um, and being such a kind person. 
And now we are moving to our last uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Vilile Bellani, all the way there in Iswatini. And we are very thankful that the technology is holding up, um, Valile. We were a bit scared about that. I hand over to you for um, your 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Just to um, start off, um, I'm, I'd like to say, I, to send my uh, condolences to uh, Prof. Shelley there uh, on her loss. Um, so, so today I will um, speak about the experiences of trans people. Um, they transcend the workplace and in, in, in general society. I'm not a gender specialist. I should, I should stipulate that. Um, and I'm, an, I'm an engineer by profession. However, my positioning and unique experiences, which are almost considered taboo in this uh, society, bring me to this conversation. Um, I want to start my talk with the root of the problem. Um, we are who we are because our brains are configured in particular ways which align with either feminine or, or the masculine spectrum of identities. Unfortunately, we are in a society where gender is assigned from the shape of particular body parts at birth. No attention is paid to brain configuration. This technically means we gamble from the onset, hoping that gender of each new, or hoping that the gender of each newborn which is a function of their brain configuration, aligns with their sex. Most times we get it right since there's a statistically greater number of cisgender persons in the population. Cisgender means people who, whose gender identity and expression mix, matches their biological sex. However, we do not always get it right. There's a percentage of newborns that are misgendered at birth. Most times the caregiver doesn't know something is wrong and may enforce punitive measures on any behavior that deviates from the assigned expected gender norms. However, these punitive measures are not only meant to get transgender persons to conform, but this also, these punitive measures are meant um, to get transgender people to conform, but this does not necessarily mean their, uh, their brain is silent. The brain becomes a clanging bell, almost like a, the church bell you hear every Sunday morning. The difference being this one doesn't stop. It reminds you every chance you get that you do not belong here. Every mirror reflection, every glimpse you catch on the reflective surface of the mall. If you're trans masculine, every person who calls you she and all the dolls and dresses you receive as birthday presents, the excruciation pain of undergoing female puberty and developing female sex characteristics. This is called gender dysphoria and it infringes on the daily existence of trans persons to the point of suicide. Medical in interventions are needed at this point to combat gender dysphoria. However, I don't want to leave the, percep the perception that uh, transgender is a med med mental condition because I've, I've made so much reference to brain configuration. It more accurately is a physical condition where you physically cannot manifest what you are at your core. So my talk dwells on what happens when a trans person seeks the medical help while position whilst positioned in a work environment. Undergoing a gender transition discloses your transgender identity, making you susceptible to workplace discrimination. This discrimination is particularly troubling in light of the research which stipulates that 90% of transgender persons are exper experiencing harassment or are actively taking action to avoid harass harassment. This is because the harassment of transgender persons in the workplace is five times more likely to escalate to physical assault or ultimately lead to a negative, negative job outcome like being fired or denied promotion. Presented with the challenge of transitioning in the workplace, Dr. Anastasia Thompson and Matla Tsenguna are examples of transgender women who saw leaving the workplace and being unemployed as the most viable option to avoid discrimination. Open quotes. I chose not to rock the boat. Even if I had fought to keep my position, what would have I have been left with? It might, it might have left me in an uncomfortable position with coworkers and patients. The question is why would one opt to leave the South African workplace in order to transition because South Africa's progressive constitution protects the rights of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people. Whilst this is true, the South African mindset has not been as progressive as the constitution. Consequently, the treatment of transgender persons in the workplace largely depends on organizational culture and organizations need to make explicit efforts to enact policies that protect transgender staff. For instance, 
transgender employees are pitted against the gender hierarchies that exist in the workplace. Organizations expect employees to look professional, and this expectation is often embedded in meeting traditional gender hierarchies. Consequently, transgender people are either forced to abandon their true identity and perform the expected gender, and deviating from this expectation renders them vulnerable to structural dis discrimination, which escalates when the transgender employee medically transitions to alleviate gender dysphoria. During this process, the employee undergoes puberty and starts to physically present as ambiguous or androgynous, which disrupts the gender hierarchies. If there are no active transgender policies, the employer may handle the transition poorly and cultivate a hostile response from other employees. An example of this can be drawn from Matlatse's transition in the workplace. Matlatse's trans woman went through being addressed as male and had to use a male men's bathroom until her physical appearance was too hard and uncomfortable to hide. A male colleague expressed discomfort with sharing a bathroom with a woman. I couldn't continue using the men's bathroom. It just didn't make sense. After the involvement of management in addressing the issue, the microaggression started. They went around asking all the other women in the office if they are comfortable with me. The way her employer handled her transition cultivated a work environment that other martial and caused her to isolate herself completely. And to this day, she still uses the bathroom on a different um, floor to her office to avoid the colleagues. The harassment of transgender persons in the workplace is perpetuated by ignorance and a sense of entitlement to trans people's identities, which is rooted in the misconception that sex and gender are the same thing. Society infers gender from bad sex, and this process is favorable for cisgender persons, but it's completely wrong for transgender people. Gender is classified as either male or female on all functional and fundamental documents of identification, which is the birth certificates, national identity, the driver's license, etc. The intersection of the birth certificates, the transgender identity, and access to public spaces like toilets is a contested issue in the 21st century. Society has this problem because it has oversimplified gender. Gender was erroneously assumed to be immutable to the extent that no one questioned the effect of including gender classification on all fundamental documents of identity. Transgender people are positioned at the intersection of this oversimplified version of sex, gender, and the law. The gender classification, male or female, gender expression, and physical anatomy often collide with the oversimplified reading version of gender that is known by officials. The experience of trans persons being gendered as fugitives can be summarized by a quote from this trans woman informant. I do not suffer from gender dysphoria. I suffer from bureaucratic dysphoria. My ID does not match my appearance. I worry every time I have to apply for a job, every time I have to authorize a credit card check, every time I buy a plane ticket, every time I buy beer at the corner daily. I have changed my name, but my gender continues to be officially and bureaucratically made. Efforts to change this documented gender marker are met with sheer resistance to extend that required lit a litigation process. Even in South Africa, where there are progressive laws that allow for changing of gender markers in national identity documents, trans people are still faced with nuanced responses from administrative officials who sometimes demand that they must undergo full sex reassignment surgery to access this law. This disenfranchises is transgender persons since the waiting period for sex reassignment surgery in South Africa known is up to 20 years. This means that transgender persons are gendered as fugitives for a better portion of their lives and forced to live with a national identity document that is incongruent with their physical appearance. So a trans woman reported experience of attaining a legal doc uh, documents to home affairs and how this gave an opportunity for home affairs official, officials to correct the image because it had migrated from the norms expected from the assigned male gender that reflected in her birth certificate. Home, home affairs officials refused to issue a national identity card up until she conformed to the highest degree to her assigned male gender. I had to be taken to the superiors, open course. I had to be taken to their superiors because they didn't understand me. But luckily, she was friendly and explained to me that a person has to look as natural as possible in their national ID. She asked me to remove my makeup, earrings, and I had to undo my braids, which I had just done the previous day. Because my hair is long, I had to tie it at the back. Incongruent uh, 
identity documents affect, affect employability, employment, and access to services. They invite a inherent, an inherent bias when transgender persons apply for employment, attend interviews, or even try to access specific medical aid benefits within the workplace, which are often cisgendered. Simply put, if you are a trans woman who has a male gender marker in their, in, in their ID, you will not be ex able to access estrogen therapy, for instance, or medical aid, because that will be reserved for cisgender women. You won't be able to access surgery because uh, that's uh, uh, recognized as cosmetic. And this also opens up room for workplace microaggressions, which leverage of the fact that the trans woman is legally considered male. Therefore, it is uncommon. Therefore, it's not uncommon for the workplace environment to enforce that transgender employees be referred to as their legally assigned gender pronoun, which often cause, causes confusion because the person doesn't look like that anymore. To smooth interactions with coworkers, transgender persons perform a significant amount of legwork to facilitate the understanding of their colleagues in the form of informal and sometimes formal psychoeducation on transgender issues. This is done in a quest to help others get used to the idea and try to get and try to educate people so that they feel heard, so that they actually do all the work by themselves. I had to here's another person's experience. I had to write an email that teaches about transgender issues and copied my immediate co-workers. My department copied the email and sent it through to the entire faculty. As soon as the email was sent, I got a lot of LinkedIn hits where people were viewing my profile and possibly because they were trying to assign a face to the name. They essentially outed, this essentially outed me to people who were not even aware that I was transgender in the first instance. So work environments need to reach a place where it is not taboo to be different in the workplace to extents that prompt investigations on who is transgender in the workplace. Because only after the transgender experience is normalized as a daily existence are we going to see a shift in attitudes on the treatments of transgender persons in the workplace. So to support what the workplace can do to support a um, transitioning coworker, you can sponsor representatives from LGBT affirming groups or a therapist, a knowledgeable one, not every therapist, a knowledgeable one, to train coworkers about gender identity issues. This saves the transgender employee from being asked unusual questions about. This saves the transgender employee from being asked unusual questions from coworkers that do not fully understand what is happening, or the ones that become curious about gender person. This informs the human resources department to, ch to challenge their inherent bias when meeting applicants who may have incongruent national identity documents and creates an awareness which upskills human resources professionals to deal effectively with transgender applicants. Working environments uh, that have specific gender presentations, each uniforms, contain spaces that are divided into gender binaries, bathrooms, lockers, et cetera, must immediately grant, grant access to, trans, to the trans, transgender employee with uh, access to facts, they must grant access to the facilities that they identify with. They must also set up policies for workplace gender transitions that document the exact protocols that are to be followed by the transgender employee and the human resources department management and co-workers. Um, with that, um, I thank you all. Thank you, Kulile. Um, I think you have, uh, yeah, I'm reading there. Thank you for assisting us to open our minds more is a comment from Ilana Pereira. And that is exactly, I think, what, what um, you have done, uh, not just for Ilana, but for, for all of us um, attending this webinar. Um, I have noted some questions or some comments. And I'm just looking at the time. We still have some time. If you have uh, questions uh, for any of our panelists, please um, add them in the chat box. But um, one thing that I've noticed is, uh, other than most of the people that have written comments, um, finding um, the webinar and all of your input inspiring and motivational and um, touching on, on the truth, not touching, you know, speaking the truth. One thing that came through or theme is that um, the um, feeling or opinion that as, as uh, women, 
or yeah, mostly, um, we create those biases ourselves um, through our attitudes, through um, the use of language, um, and um, through being like servant orientated. Can I have your opinions um, on that? I'm, I'm going to start with Nomkita. Um, Nomkita, what is your uh, opinion on that? I know you've touched a little bit on it in the um, in most of you in your presentations, but what can we do in a society? What can we do about ourselves, basically? Yeah, I'm in agreement with that statement, Lizo. I do think that that is what we do. I remember a quote I read many, many years ago, I can't remember who it was by, uh, that says that nothing happens to you without your cooperation and, and also without your consent. So it's important that as women, we can't then apportion the blame to the other gender uh, and say that you guys are treating us like this because if we had stood up immediately at the time, therefore it would not have gone ahead. So we do tend to sponsor patriarchy as women. And I think that's one of the things we need to be conscious of. Thank you. Um, Shirley, Rajni, Belile, do you want to comment on that, Shirley? I see your hand going. Thank you very much, Liesl. I think that, um, that what you've just indicated is, is, is very, very true. And I think what we need to do is um, we need to reframe gender bias in the workplace because for me, it is a matter of ethics at the end of the day. Um, discrimination uh, across all genders, you know, um, um, it, um, especially women, and as we was, 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 was expanding our, our, our thinking here, I think we need to include, um, we need to create inclusive cultures, and we need to say that gender biases of any sort in the workplace is a matter of, of ethical violation where it happens, and, and that we need to uh, call it out every opportunity um, that we get. It is um, our responsibility to deal with um, social justice issues. And this is what it comes down to at the end. It's all about our humanity and bringing our whole selves to work. And this needs to go beyond the box ticking that we see in the BE codes, in employment equity, um, et cetera. It is truly um, at the heart of social injustice that we need to you know, have a look and see how we can improve um, our position in the workplace. Um, and, and that it is, it is unethical to discriminate against people. Um, we, 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 I mean, a lot has been said here about women continue to be sparse at, and, and rare at the top levels of organizations still today. Um, um, and and um, uh, Rashni, I was just interviewed yesterday um, by the JSE who was doing, preparing their report for this year on that very matter that you raised um, about um, 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 so few women um, and the gender policies to ensure that um, we have an inclusive gendered um, um, approach to how we are appointing women onto our boards, for example, in listed companies um, uh, in South Africa. And that um, gender discrimination is expressed and manifested in our processes, in our policies, in our meeting culture, in our, in our organizational and individual behavior. We've talked about pay gaps, progression, recruitment, leave policies, sexual harassment, and uh, GBV. It might just be uh, microaggressions in some places, but microaggressions are, are, are hugely um, 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 uh, um, distressing and painful and hurtful towards people. And I think post-COVID, we are going to be in a situation where we have to really ensure that we are building organizations and that we are using um, our leadership capability to apply a duty of care and diligence in the workplace when it comes to these matters. Thank you, Liesl. Thank you very much, Shirley. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask just Roshni and Belile then to give us just one last thought, if there's one thing that you can do to change gender bias in the, in the workplace, one thing, what would that be? 
Uh, education. Really? Education. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, for me, it will be education because the workplace is a microcosm of society. And as it stands right now, the issue is with society and it all translates to a workplace. So instead of teaching uh, children that there's a boy and a girl and people come in two flavors, chocolate, vanilla, we need to teach children that actually it's people exist on a spectrum and at a very young age, they need to be understanding that people are different. So that by the time you get to adults, other other thing and you're in the workplace, um, people already have the basis of the knowledge. You shouldn't be starting from scratch. Because then people there are not willing to listen to the ideas. They're like, no, we grew up like this, this is what we know, and that's it. Thank you, Lili. Thank you very much. Uh, Rajnik, your last one thing that you will do. Thanks, Liesl. So I do think that companies need to start becoming a lot more intentional about the commitment to identifying where the biases are in the system and actually doing something about those. And most importantly, creating safe spaces for employees once they feel they've been discriminated against, even if it's their own perception, there must be a safe space to go and report it somewhere and for those reports to all be looked at quite critically. Um, and then alongside with that is it's the principle of solidarity. So we can all point fingers to males being females or the other way around. But if we start creating support amongst our own peers, that, it, that solidarity in itself will start creating a movement of change that's very, very difficult to stop once it start, get, starts gaining its momentum. And that's important. Thank you. Um, well, I'm, I want to thank all of you, Rajni, Shirley, Belile, Nomkita. Thank you so much. I'm going to leave the final thank you um, to Dr. Brian Robinson, but it was an honor um, to have you on our panel and to listen to your great insight and experience. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Liesl. Appreciate. Um, I, I presented a paper earlier this week at the International Association of Business in Society and um, attending another paper session, uh, Professor Isabel Fisher of Warwick Business School uh, presented a paper, um, I'm just going to summarize it, but it's, it's called Conceptualizing Students' Perceptions of Factors Influencing Employment Outcomes. And, and one, one of the emerging themes that came out of, out of her paper was, was the, the stark difference between students' perception about workplace bias and, and those already employed. So for students, um, they didn't see gender as being an issue. Um, when they, you know, sometime in the future. But for people who were already in the workplace, who were working, they perceive gender as a major impact on their employment. Um, I'd like to thank you, Liesl, Nomkita, Roshni, Belile, Shirley, um, for just a fascinating uh, discussion. And I believe these conversations can contribute somewhat to the erosion of gender bias in, in, in the workplace. So that these students, um, these students' idealism about gender bias um, is actually, or the non-existence of gender bias is actually the reality uh, in, in the workplace and, and that we get to that level at some stage. As Shirley says, um, it's, the impossible is possible and that's definitely the case. Um, I, so thank you all very much. Um, uh, we began working on this joint strategic conversation in February already. Um, Roshni has been one of the drivers behind having these uh, strategic conversations at, at the business school with, with Ben Africa, and it's the third one that we've held. Um, things changed drastically since, since February, and we had to go into this virtual format. We've all had to learn a lot uh, doing this, but a lot of work has gone on behind the scenes, and um, and, and just we need to, to say thank you to, to some people. Firstly, the business school management. Um, we have enormous support from management. Dr. Jonas, um, who's with us today, Professor Arnold, Ms. Basi, who did the introduction, and, and Mr. Mouton, thank you. 
the business school's marketing and technical team. Um, and we've got to mention Terence Shane Bath, who's been coordinating today's uh, webinar, is our media technician and ICT guru. Thank you, Terence, you've done a wonderful job. Uh, the executive committee of Ben Africa, with special mention of Dr. Andrade, who's been posting these philosophical comments on, on the chat. Um, He's, he's been marketing the, um, the event through Ben Africa's various networks and affiliations. Thank you, Julia. And then all of you have joined us today. Um, that, uh, it's been wonderful having you part of this um, and, and hopefully we can make this an impactful event where, where the conversation will not, not end here, but will continue in your work organizations, in your homes, and, and that we all contribute to alleviating gender bias and these stereotypes in, in the workplace. So thank you all very much. And, and just a last punt, um, we, we, uh, the business school is holding a regular business rebound webinar sessions and the next one is on Tuesday at 4 p.m. Uh, the speaker is Professor Dr. Gert Schwander, the former mayor of the city of Oldenburg in Germany and professor of international management and marketing strategies. His topic of the webinar is how is COVID-19 influencing geopolitics and international business and trade? With that, thank you very much. And goodbye. Thank you, thank you Brian and Liesel. Thank you, everyone. Really, really. Um, I had a good session and you, I hope you've read the comments um, and, and the thanks that was expressed there. I really do, please do so. And take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.